Welcome into a brand new episode of the Whole Story Podcast. On today's episode, Melanie Newman, who will be the play-by-play broadcaster for the Baltimore Orioles this upcoming season. Melanie, it's just simply been an unprecedented time the last few weeks and months. What has it been like for you? You had the excitement building to be able to say you're going to play-by-play broadcast for the Baltimore Orioles in the 2020 season, and then everything gets halted the play of baseball gets stopped and now it looks like we will be seeing baseball return to play here in just a few weeks walk me through what has the last few weeks and months been like for you starting this year was surreal I mean that's that's the only word you can use to describe it we saw what was coming down with other leagues around the country and you hear the whispers that sports might be coming to a halt and that this was becoming a very serious thing in the United States and Of course, at that point, we had no idea, you know, how big the whole COVID-19 pandemic was, because at that point, it was like, how are we losing sports? You know, America and sports, that's, that's how we do life. Um, And, and so I had that one game under my belt with Baltimore. I hadn't had a sideline assignment yet. It was just the one radio appearance. Uh, And we were waiting actually for our night game. We were set to go down to Fort Myers. We had early morning clubhouse, which was already taking the precautions of, you know, we had to talk to guys from six feet away and, uh, you know, the territory that came with that. But we finished up clubhouse and I, I looked at my partner, Jeff Arnold, and we both kind of said, I don't, I don't think we need to, to drive to Fort Myers yet because it's still another hour and a half uh, from Sarasota down there. And then for me staying in Tampa, you're looking at about a three hour round trip, assuming Florida has no traffic at all, which it never does. So we made the decision instead of driving down early to get a bite to eat, we were just going to hang out and grab food at a local place in downtown Sarasota and and figured, you know what, if the buses leave, we'll catch them. It'll be quick. No issues. So we hung out for, for probably an hour and a half before I finally said, yeah, I'm I'm really hungry and uh, I don't do well in the hangry department. So I shuttled him off and we were still there another hour, hour and a half, you know, we finished our meals and it just feels like, the longest day and it's it's not even one o'clock yet and and we hadn't you know we got to the clubhouse nine o'clock which is pretty run of the mill there but it just it felt like everything kept dragging out and that's when you started seeing you know the Mariners spring training game was canceled the Diamondbacks spring training game was canceled but we kept seeing those were weather related issues so we're like oh we're fine and then the afternoon game started coming to a halt and then finally uh Jeff pulled up Twitter where our beat reporters who had stayed back at the complex said, Oh, you know, the buses have just left. So great. You know, we asked for our check by the time the check hit the table, I think it was rock Kubatko actually who had, who had tweeted it first or John Mayoli, but they said the buses are, are back at the state facility. They, they've been gone for a grand total of three minutes, did a loop and uh, the players are, are getting off the bus. And so we thought, okay, Maybe we're in a holding pattern right now, just waiting to see. We had good communication with our PR staff, and they said, yeah, just just hang tight. You know, I'm sure everything will be fine. And then it just stopped. Um, I went back to Tampa, having done all this prep work for this game that just sat there on the ledge and and never really came to fruition. Um, I, I actually, that was the first night I slept in a long time because it was like, all right, there's there's nothing to prep for right now. And after having this month of, of self-applied pressure and, and trying to keep up with everything, it honestly was nice to just have a breather. But I also thought we'd have that breather for two to three weeks, not two to three months. Uh, so it became real. Um, probably two weeks in, just sitting at home and, and being back with my family for the first time in over a decade. And uh not really understanding what we're supposed to do because in the ideal world, you, you just keep prepping for the season. But if you don't know if you're going to have a season and you don't know who your opponents are even are or how many games or any of that, you know, at, at that point you're, you're almost over preparing for work that's going to just be thrown away, which there's nothing wrong with a little over preparing, but I mean, you don't want to extend yourself to the point of, of just exhaustion so it, it kind of took a step back and, and started focusing on at-home workouts in Spanish and, you know, all the little things that still kind of contribute into being a professional, uh, but not necessarily thinking about the game too much. Reading an article here and there throughout the day, but none of them had to do with the speculation of will we or won't we play, which, of course, now we know we will. 
Um, just because that back and forth ping ponging that we had almost every day of will they or won't they, it, again, it was just, it was speculation. It was taking up extra headspace that it didn't need to take up. You know, I was like, wait, when we get something definite, I'll, I'll be tuned in then. Um, and of course the news came down. Robert Manfred has imposed the season. It's 60 games. We're going to start towards the end of July. It's very weird. You know, I, I never worked in a short season affiliate, so I can't fully relate to that side of it. But um, you always think about how long the grind of baseball is. And it usually takes me four or five weeks to push through that, that mentality of seven days a week, 15 hours a day. You know, we're back in baseball. We can do this. And now I'm sitting there looking at it like, okay, well, if I run into that this year, we're going to have a week or two left in the season by the time I get through that. Um, so it's been crazy. We've had phone calls all day today, uh, emails, and, and just everything seems to be blowing up right now. Now that it's the reality that players have reported to camps, they've started their medical screenings. Um, and it's, it's still going to be a very weird and surreal situation once we're at the ballpark because there will be no fans. You know, there's no hugging. There's no close conversations and getting drinks with your coworkers afterwards and breaking down the game. I mean, everything is so sterile and, and so spaced apart. I mean, we're even, we're, we're packing our lunches to take to the ballpark. You know, there's not going to be food offerings in the park. And we, they actually told us, they said, yeah, the water fountains won't be working either. And for me, I'm like, Oh, like, I gotta, I gotta start carrying gallons. Like what are we going to do? Um, right. But you know, at, at the end of the day, we do have baseball coming back. And, and for that, I'm very thankful because I think to have completely lost the season, which I can't imagine the pain of, of minor league right now, uh, having that been my home for so long and, and knowing what that means to thousands of people. But uh, having any season is, is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Melanie, walk me through. It's been talked and tossed ideas of what the broadcasters are doing right now. When games are going to start up, what are the broadcasters going to be doing? Are they going to be broadcasting games from the home stadiums when the team is on the road? Has this been what the ongoing conversations that you are currently having um, with everyone involved in the decision-making of this? Can you provide some sort of uh, insight into what you will be doing, your partners will be doing, for this shortened 60 game season and how you can prepare for this where you might be seeing video of a game from wherever the Orioles may be playing that night. Now, um, we actually haven't gone over the logistics of how our broadcasts are going to work. So far, all that has been covered because that has been set in stone by Major League Baseball is the actual in-stadium operations for our home clubs. And, and that encompasses the writers, the photographers, the local news and the like. Um, and we, we did receive further instruction, you know, that our specific stations would be responsible for us as well, especially given between I have a split role as the sideline reporter for Mid-Atlantic Sports Network and then being in the booth for Baltimore Radio. Um, both of those entities have obviously a lot more responsibility because they are attached to the park every day. You know, they're, they're not a third party site or, or anybody like that who can kind of come and go as they please. It's literally our job to be a part of this team and to be that bridge to bring it over to fans. So it's a very serious responsibility. Um, and again, nothing being official. These are all just things that have kind of floated out there that I've heard, obviously, Everybody's talked about it so far, and you mentioned it, the chance that you know, the road games might be called from home um, and what that's like to, to have a little bit of a delay or, or maybe not to have the camera angle that you're looking for and the, the live direct production of, you know, this shot looks really good, cut to this, or having a producer in your ear saying, hey, this is going on, you know, over in section 10, and, and we want to talk about that for a little bit. Um, so we've watched a few things in SMA actually with Dave Gorin put on a hosted conference a couple weeks ago that had to deal specifically with what happens when you call a remote event and how to handle that. So it's actually something that we're going to sit down and, and take some notes on and try to take in. Um, you know, I've been in the, the not great ballparks where you kind of had to rely on the monitor, but even then that's not the same as not even being in the stadium where things are going on. Uh, and at the same time, outside of the whole booth interaction, the sideline aspect is going to be completely different too. You know, that we aren't allowed in the clubhouse. There's no dugout access. I mean, everybody is kept 
completely separate for their own safety and health right now. And so it's, it's kind of gone back and forth of, you know, every regional network is probably going to have their say in what the sideline reporter will and won't do and how they'll best serve the broadcast. And at the same time, I've heard, you know, that might be the only person out of the broadcast team who actually travels with the team. Mm -hmm. So whichever way they end up um, making their decision and certainly, you know, it's to the best of everybody's health and abilities, we're going to roll with it. Uh, yeah, beats being on a minor league bus and having the bus break down and I've handled that. So we'll handle this too, but, it's going to be a very different broadcast this year. And, and down to the fact that when fans tune in, you know, they, they won't see their fellow fans in the stands. Now you mentioned obviously no fans in attendance in 2020. What's that like? Obviously no one's really experienced broadcasting games with no fans. There's only been some fans, some background noise, but what do you think you might react differently with having no fans? Because anyone that knows and listens to baseball on the radio or on TV, you have to let the broadcast breathe. But anyone that knows when there are no fans in attendance, those broadcasts, when you let those games breathe, those five to 10 seconds of quote unquote dead air that you're putting on there, those sound not like 10 seconds. Those sound like 10 minutes. So how can you as a broadcaster somehow take a breath, let the broadcast breathe, but also at the same time know that there isn't so much going on in the background to provide the broadcast to breathe? It's going to be different. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's, it's weird when you lay out and there's no noise there at all. Uh, now, Baltimore does have that odd anomaly of being a team that does know what it's like to play without fans. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, it just wasn't a safe situation to bring anybody into the park and getting to talk to the members of the media who had covered the team that year and who took in that game and, and really the week leading up to it and everything around that at that time, uh, they all just had the same sentiment, you know, that it, it didn't feel really like real baseball, that they, that you were missing that. And even today they were mentioning, you know, these guys have to be self-starters this year because if you're in a slump or you guys just can't get energized, there was a long flight. And luckily this year, there won't be any of the East West coast flight hangovers for any of these teams, but the travel will still get to you a little bit. Um, and realizing that you're going to be the person who has to pull yourself up. There's not going to be the, the cheering and the noise behind you to pull that through. At that point, you really can only hope that you have a good sound crew um, who's able to pull the natural sound from the dugout and from the guys around and, and hopefully bring in some of that energy because you do still have to lay out for some moments. You know, you can't just talk the whole time. And, and it is a benefit having been in the minor leagues and at one point being in a franchise that we might have been lucky to have 10 people in the ballpark that night because it, it grew a very uh, familiar concept of – being okay that the other end of the crowd mic was quiet and just understanding, you know, it's, it's more of a disservice to, to keep rambling and talking and just feeling awkward in the quiet space uh, than it was to, to just have an uncomfortable couple of, of quiet seconds. So hopefully it doesn't come to that. I've even seen some people joke that they're just going to send a sound crew out to, to a local sports bar and like pipe in the fan noise from there as they watch on TV, which would be very interesting. Um, and certainly a lot of work for our editors to make sure everything was kept clean, but it's, it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. Melanie, let's switch gears. Anyone that knows you knows that you've loved the game of baseball your entire life. And now you are working in the game, covering the game for many years now. What's this whole transition been like for you to fall in love with a game as a fan to then transition to it from a standpoint of working in the game so now being a fan, but at the end of the day, you are still working in the game, but are still a fan of it. Uh, what's just this whole experience and journey? I love the journey aspect of everything been like for you personally. Yeah, I think being a fan and, and working in the game and loving your job, they really go hand in hand. Uh, and, and not that this discriminates or disqualifies anybody from pursuing a role in this industry, but I think a unique aspect of my type of fandom growing up um, was because I wasn't athletic and, and I was a very quiet kid. So my type of fandom was, you know, reading books and, and knowing the ins and outs and the rules and, and why is that out and why is that safe or, you know, 
what, what just happened in this scenario and, and having my family who was there to break that all down and explain that to me. So I, I was never really loud and latched on and growing up as a kid and being a fan of Boston, you know, you didn't have a lot for a long time to latch on to in the first place, which is hard for the younger generation now to understand that they haven't always been a winning machine, but it, it just grew a very even keeled uh, fan in me and, and wanting to study the game and appreciating the losing seasons and, and the heartbreak and the drama and everything that surrounds it because it's such a storybook for every team, every season, uh, regardless of what their final numbers are at the end of the year. And once I started to develop the writing aspect of my career and really thought that that was a strength that I had and something I wanted to pursue, I, I was good with that. You know, I thought that was it and had a very fortunate college professor and advisor who said, no, I think we need to switch you over to broadcasting. And from there, it, it was a complete eye opener. I had no idea the work that went behind, you know, serving as a sideline reporter and eventually the work that went into serving in the booth and, and being a play by play and color analyst on top of it. And so over the years, I've had good mentors. I've had good broadcast partners who have been willing to sit down and, and show me the ropes and show me all of it that goes into it. So when you have the hard days at work, uh, people make fun of me because I have almost every off day from 2018 and 2019, we're at some other park. Uh, in Texas, we were lucky because there were so many different teams. So we had an off day where we went to watch an indie ball club. And it was actually really neat because the guy who had started the season with us was now with them and to see him continue his dream in a different format and to see how their park runs and knowing all of the intricacies and the backbone that goes behind putting on that production. Uh, it just lets you sit back and, and knowing that you don't have to do anything that day, you know, you're not making sure stat packs are done or you don't have to make sure that the promo crew is out in the seventh inning, but being able to watch it as a fan in those moments reinforces this is why we work in the game and this is why we love the game and vice versa you know when you don't get to sit in the stands and be a fan and you are working you still get to look down on all those fans who are sitting in the stands below you and you know the emotions that are going through some of their heads and, and you know the discussions that are being had and the smell of the roasted peanuts and the popcorn and the hot dogs that are down below and some of the little kids who are having their first memories and some people who are having their last memories at the ballpark. And they just, they play off of each other so beautifully. I really think it feeds into the longevity of, of being able to be in this industry. Now, Money, in that first response, you talked about your writing skills. How much has your learning how to write and how to write, frankly, good helped you as a broadcaster throughout your career? It's been huge. Uh, and it was a skill that I certainly still hold on to to this day, even though my writing now is, is for my own personal use, or it'll be a personal essay that I'll put on my website regarding the game in itself. But it gives you a sense of proper communication and the actual backbone of storytelling, you know, and how do you put something together? Because even when you're telling a story vocally, you still have to know where you're going. Uh, if you get lost along the way during an inning, the crowd gets lost with you and then they lose the value of that story that you're bringing to light in the first place. Uh, so I feel really fortunate. And, and really the only reason why I started out with a print background was just out of being shy. You know, I, I wasn't the person who spoke to people, but I loved writing. I loved reading. Um, you know, I was the kid with the flashlight under the bed, which is probably why I'm blind now, but it, it books and, and the ability to express yourself that way just always captivated me. And I think people see that at the end of the day when they can look not only at your clips and hear what you have to say, but they can go online and, and see some of these thoughts written out and really fleshed out where you don't have a time limit and uh, you can kind of take things down different avenues and alleyways. Uh, they, it's really fortunate if you're the type of person who chooses to have the discipline to master both your written and verbal communication skills in a communication industry where uh, it's lost on some people. Well said, of course, and it's certainly an industry that you have to have a passion for doing it. And if you don't have that passion, if you don't have that knack of loving broadcasting, um, then you might find out that I don't really like this. <laughs> and you might go out and find a different career line because like what you just said, basically to, you know, you have to love what you do every single day. 
and you have to just enjoy being at the ballpark every single day as well. Yeah. And it's funny too, because there's, everybody wants to glamorize the industry and, and you wake up here and it's just great and everything's handed to you. But I, I've, I've had more times of really pushing myself and, and getting an opportunity, but it's unpaid and saying, you know, okay, I'm, I'm X years into this industry at this point. What, at what time do I turn down the unpaid jobs and insist that, you know, something has to be taken care of, even if it's only travel expenses. Um, and the blood, sweat and tears that go behind that. I mean, I've, I've had days of working five games in a day for four or five days straight. And you're kind of just loopy at that point because it's just all rotating around the same teams that you've been talking to. And, you know, you, you sweat half of your body weight out at a game where there's no shade and, and it just can't seem to end. And, packing up and moving to states in these tiny towns that I've never been to before. Um, there's, there's so much behind it that people don't understand, but I will say this, it's the only relationship with anything I have in my life. And that's living or inanimate that I have been pushed to tears and uh, saying some not suited for work sentiments and maybe screaming them at some points. And on the inside, still knowing you know, I love this more than anything and that this is where I'm meant to be. I mean, if you want to talk about watching some, like a person push you to that level, you're never, you're never letting that person back in your life. That's it. <laughs> They're written off. But uh, at the end of the day, whether it's that particular sport or just the, the art of broadcasting in itself, um, and certainly I would hope that the two feelings are, are just as strong but it calls you back and, and there's just some things in life and it's a different calling for every single person out there. But once you find it, uh, you, you have to white knuckle death grip onto it. And regardless of what people say and, and what events happen, including this crazy year that we've been having that, uh, that you hold true to it, because at the end of the day, uh, that's, that's what matters is when you, when you wake up doing what you're really designed to do. Melanie, this is my favorite part of the show. It's a fast five quick round. It's five quick questions, and you have however oh. long you take to answer them. If you want to expand on any, you certainly can. Are you ready? Let's go. What is your biggest pet peeve? <sighs> Not putting down cell phones in conversations. Uh, and I understand, you know, if an urgent phone call, text message, email pops up and, and you got to get on it right then, but 90% of the time, and I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes this tethered generation we're growing up in is always on the phone. Just put it down for like five minutes. That's it. Or put it down for a meal or put it down for something. Uh, I'm super proud of the time that I've cut down being on my phone while I've been at home, but just, just listen, eye contact. It's good stuff. 100%. You know, this past weekend, it's really the last weekend where there are no sports happening in some way. So I logged off all social media uh, for the three days. And on oh, Monday, amazing. I felt amazing. You know, it's right. It's life changing. There's actually there's a, a really good documentary on Hulu. Uh, and I'll, I'll have to send you the name of it. But it's it's about technology addiction, and it will blow your mind. Mm hmm. Definitely. Second one, who is one current or former broadcaster you would love to call one game with that you have not yet? Who? I mean, I feel like everybody says Vin Scully. So I'm going to get, I'm going to be annoying and I'm going to give it twofold here because I do say Vin only because once I realize this is what I want to do, the way he did it, is the most captivating broadcaster I've ever heard in my life. And even if it means just sitting in the booth and listening to him only while he calls a game, I, I would probably donate a kidney for that experience. Uh, and in terms of current broadcasters right now, it would be Eric Nadell because my time in Texas, he was so kind and, and just reached out and really did everything that he could to be inclusive and to be supportive of the younger broadcasters coming up behind him. And the limericks that he writes around the game are so neat. And I just think he gives another element that uh, you don't really see anywhere else. What is one dream car you've always wanted to own? Now let's change through the years. So the always is tricky because I can tell you when I was five, I wanted a hot pink Barbie convertible <laughs> and that was life. Uh, and then it rotated into a red black soft top Jeep Wrangler 
for a long time. My parents told me insurance was too expensive. I didn't know what insurance was. That's, that's made up. Um, I did fall in love though with the infinity. I think it's the Q X 60 or the Q 60, uh, the rental car company messed up and gave it to me during a sporting event this year before everything got shut down. And I, I might've contemplated driving that car back to spring training from where we're at. It's beautiful. What is one of your favorite pieces of sports memorabilia that you own? Uh, so I don't own it, but I just purchased it for my dad for father's day. And it's a Bo Jackson autographed baseball. Uh, wow. Growing up, he was he was the myth, you know, larger than life guy. And and I got really fortunate in my time. I was able to give my dad uh, a Hank Aaron ball and a Randy Johnson ball. But I, I don't know Bo, and I couldn't pull any, you know, strings to find Bo. So I, I coughed up the money for it. But that that one I was pretty pretty proud to be able to hand over to him. Melanie, the last one for the Fast Five. It's one that I always like to throw in there. It's an interesting question, one that I always like to ask someone that I know might have a good answer for this. What is one question you've always wanted to have been asked but never have? Oh. Oh, those are like those interview questions when you go to a job. That's tough. I mean, I really feel like, and half of this is, I've always been an open book, maybe to a fault, uh, or at least that's what I was told as a kid growing up. Um, so, you know, it, anybody could ask me anything really, and I never hesitated in answering it. Um, I don't know. I really don't. I feel arrogant. Say, I don't know if I've had a question that I haven't been asked that I, I've just wanted to give. What's one question that you've never been asked? I would say just um, focusing on the career aspect. You know, it's always interesting when people always do interviews and stuff like that and just figuring out who they are as people. I think that's the most important thing is figuring out, okay, yeah, sure, you're a broadcaster, but there's more behind it. You know, why did you choose this? career you know why did you dedicate all the blood sweat and tears like you were talking about earlier to this there's a reason for everything in life and I think when people do interviews like these it's those important questions that should be asked because those are the things that matter in learning who the people are I I could not agree more and you speak so much to to the why that I'm in this industry and explaining you know how who these athletes are as human beings and what makes them the athlete that they are I've so much respect for that. That's fantastic. So Melanie, my last question for you is simple. If a 15 year old kid walked up to you right now and told you that they don't understand the game of baseball and it is boring to them, what would you say to them? I think that's one. Uh, there really aren't words that you can say. Um, that's showing a video, showing a photo taking them to a game, showing them a play. And, and that doesn't even have to be a major league game. I mean, go to a minor league park, go to a high school or a college park and, and just sitting in the outfield and, and pointing out all of these different things. You know, the fact that a first round draft pick has a 60% chance to make it to the majors, that's failing in any other field, 60% is failing. And yet they still try. And at the end of the day, we're seeing, these triumphant guys, you know, after the 10th round, you have a 6% chance of making it. John Means was the Orioles opening day starter at home. He had a 6% chance of making it. And you look at those odds and you look at everything that goes behind it and, and just the sheer survival and the push to be in this sport, even as a little kid. And they're telling you, you know, you're going to hit a round ball with a round bat and it's going to go 300 feet. And, and you have to run all of this distance and everything that goes behind it. And some of these amazing individuals, both on and off the field, have come before us. Uh, and that's from, you know, Roberto Clemente all the way to Ted Williams and Jim Palmer. And just what they've been able to accomplish in this lifetime. You, you have to be hands-on with this upcoming generation and, and just give them, you know, find out what makes them tick. And whether it's the flashy and the crazy stuff, you head off in that direction, you know, let, let me show you this guy licking a bat. 
Uh, and if it's the, the kid who's kind of quieter and, and kind of likes the numbers and the math and everything else, then yeah, let's, let's dive down Statistics Avenue here because we're the only sport out there today where normal fans can recite those stats and those number-based records off the top of their head. And, and I just think there's, it's our pastime for a reason and it's so beautiful. And if we miss out on the chance to hand that down to the next generation, we're really missing out. Mm -hmm. 100% agree. And to the stats aspect of what you just said, if you go to a hockey, a basketball or football game, and then you go to a baseball game, those three first sports I just named, there's no one in the stands with a scorebook or taking stats. But when you go to a baseball game, well, it's probably decreased over the last 100 years. There are still people in the stadiums or at the ballpark taking stats, tracking those errors, tracking the base sets to right field. Stats matter yeah. in baseball, and uh, I, I agree. I love it. It's it's what makes it magic. You know, you say 715, we all know what 715 is, uh, you know, and, and you go to another sport and you're like, oh, four for 14. All right. Don't know. Yeah. I mean, apart from 23, you know, the, the Falcons whole debacle against the Patriots, you're, you're going to be lost in the numbers department. Mm -hmm. 100%. But Melanie, thanks so much for taking your time to join the whole story podcast today. Where can the fans follow you on social media and, well, it's exciting, but during the 2020 baseball season. Yeah, uh, so everything with Baltimore, you can find through all of the Orioles social media and Masson. It's just M-A-S-N, Mid-Atlantic Sports Network. We'll also be on, on their channel, but, you know, they've got Instagram, Twitter, the whole nine. Uh, we've been doing a weekly show on Orioles Instagram on Wednesdays at 11 a.m., and that will continue into the season. So we're looking forward to having a, a more normalized version of that. And then uh, my social media is actually very weird because every version of Melanie and Newman had been taken back in 2009. Um, so it's actually Melanie Lynn and then N. So it's M-E-L-A-N-I-E-L-Y-N-N-E-N. It's not the greatest, but it's, it's, it's across the board. It's the website, Instagram, Twitter, the whole nine. So we've, we've stuck with the branding. You got to love it. But Melanie, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and hearing your story. And I can't wait for the 2020 baseball season. I'm ready for it.